Hi there, and welcome to Building and Construction Sciences at Mohawk College and the annual Popsicle Stick Bridge Competition. In this video, I'd like to talk to you about who can enter and how to enter this bridge competition. There's fame and fortune to be won here, so let's get started. The competition is open to full-time students in the college educational system. In order to rank for prizes, students must be carrying a full-time course load. You can still enter the competition if you are not carrying the full course load, in other words, you're out on co-op, but you will not be eligible for ranking or for any of the prizes. So, how to enter the competition consists of coming to Building and Construction Sciences and filling out an application form and purchasing the official bridge kit that includes all of the materials that you'll need to build the bridge. The entry fee is only one time. If you do run out of materials, we will give you more. And we should note that each entrant is only allowed to enter one bridge, either as yourself or you could be part of a team. Next, let's talk about the rules. I'm going to go over them quickly here, but inside each one of the bridge kits, you'll find the document containing the rules, and it's absolutely critical that you familiarize yourself with those rules. Firstly, you can only use our materials. Those are the sticks and the glue that come out of the kit. This is one of the most important rules and the one that is usually violated the most. And this means that you can't even use last year's sticks or any sticks from previous competitions. You can only use the sticks that came in the kit that you bought this year. Secondly are the dimensional rules, and once again you'll find them at the bottom of the rule sheet in more detail. But basically they're simple yet critical that you follow. The dimensions are based on basically one popsicle stick. That dimension is 110 millimeters. That dimension is 10 millimeters. Hence, the bridge cannot be any higher than 20 millimeters above the testing jig support. So two popsicle sticks in height. Below the testing jig support level, we cannot be any lower than 110 millimeters. So again, one popsicle stick in height below the testing jig surface. Thirdly, the bridge cannot be any wider than one popsicle stick or 110 millimeters. Once again, these dimensions are maximum. You can use less than those dimensions if you want to, but you may not exceed those dimensions. And if you are building this style of truss that we refer to as an arch or a W shape, it becomes absolutely critical. This dimension between the faces of the test jig is 500 millimeters. And so your bridge, if you choose to build this style, must be able to fit in between the faces of the test jig. If it doesn't, we'll give it back to you and ask you to make it fit. Thirdly, the bridge cannot weigh any more than 250 grams. Now, I want to point out that inside of the kit that you have here, you have way more than 250 grams of sticks because we know you're going to cut some, you're going to waste some, and so you're going to need more sticks than the limit. Bottom line is, if you were to use all of the sticks in the bag, you would be way over the weight limit. And once again, we would give you the bridge back and ask you to make it weigh 250 grams. So remember, we talk about using only our materials. That's absolutely critical. No toothpicks, no dowels, no other material is allowed in the competition here. So we're going to talk a little bit later about how to make round shapes out of popsicle sticks, but it's absolutely critical that they're made from our materials. So 250 grams, that's your top limit for weight. And finally, you must be the primary builder of the bridge. Can you get help with it? Absolutely. Can you get help designing it? Absolutely. If you know relatives or friends who are professionals, engineers and architects, absolutely use them for help. But once again, you must be the primary builder. So there it is, four simple rules to the competition. Next and most importantly, probably for you anyways, is how to win the competition. I have to point out that the bridge that carries the most load is not necessarily going to be the winner in this competition. Rather, the bridge with the highest performance rating is going to win this competition. Where performance rating is calculated as the load at failure that the bridge carries, and I'll define that in a moment, divided by the self-weight of the bridge. And of course, the highest performance rating is going to win the competition. Now, first of all, load at failure. The bridge does not have to smash into a thousand pieces to be considered loaded failure. All that has to happen is the bridge 
ceases to carry load. And we'll give some demonstrations about that a little bit later on. Next, the concept of performance rating really refers to how many times its own weight the bridge can carry. Let's put this into perspective. Think about your own body weight and how many times your own body weight could you lift and walk away with. And I'm thinking if that answer is any greater than two, I'm going to be pretty skeptical. Yet, one of the bridges in the most recent competition carried nearly 4,400 times its own weight. And that's just using popsicle sticks, white glue, and a little bit of knowledge about how a bridge goes together. So, it's not about building the strongest bridge, it's all about building the strongest but lightest bridge. You have to look at what you're constructing and determine if every little piece of it is going to help you carry more load. Because if it's not, well, you, you must get rid of it. Otherwise, all it's going to do is bring your performance rating down. So, once again, performance rating, load at failure divided by self-weight of the bridge. Let's talk about load at failure. Many people think the bridge has to smash into a thousand pieces in order to be considered failure, but that's not necessarily true. In some instances, we've had bridges that we call single trusses entered into the competition. And when we put them into the test jig and we try to test them, what tends to happen is they go unstable on us and fall out of the test jig without breaking. Is that failure? I think so. If we built a bridge in real life and we had to chase it down the river every spring and bring it back to its original location, I think we'd call that failure. Secondly, in that performance rating equation, there is weight involved. And so what builders have found in the past is one way to save weight is to reduce the amount of support that they have. According to the dimensional rules, you're allowed 25 millimeters of maximum support. But builders quickly figured out that they didn't need the full 25 millimeters, that they could knock that down and hence save weight. And in the performance rating equation, without carrying another extra pound of load, if you can reduce your weight, your performance rating is going to go up. But there's a limit, because what happens is if we, if we build that bridge so that it's just hanging on to the support, you have to understand that when we begin to apply load, the bridge, the top of the bridge is actually going to get shorter as it deflects. And if it falls into the test jig without breaking, without any further breaking, we're going to call that failure. In other words, load at failure is the inability of the bridge to carry any more load. It doesn't have to be destructive. It can be this form of instability. And we will call that load at failure in calculating your performance rating. So, thus far we've spoken about the rules and how to enter and who can enter, but I think what will be of most value to you is to actually see a bridge being tested. So, let me introduce you to the Doctor of Destruction, none other than Super Mario himself. He is the, the executioner, he will break your heart, he'll crush your dreams, and he'll crush your bridge, and we're going to ask him to do a demonstration in a moment or two. Super Mario? Okay, so during each one of these tests, what you're going to see is this graph that is displayed on the monitor. It is a real-time graph showing the actual status of your bridge. When the bridge test begins, you will see a line begin to rise here. That line represents the load the bridge is carrying versus the seconds that are ticking off. On top of that, you'll also see the weight of your bridge, the load that is currently being carried your bridge in real time, what the maximum load that the bridge carries so that we record that, and then finally, most importantly of all, your performance rating. Remember, everything banks on your performance rating. It's the highest performance rating that's going to win. So, as this graph rises and rises and rises, the longer it goes, the higher it goes, the better for you, but eventually what's going to happen, that graph is going to drop off. We call that load at failure. We take that load at failure, divide it by the weight of the bridge, and that becomes your performance rating. You'll also see where you rank in the standings, whether you're first or fifth or 25th. Once you're on that score sheet, there's only one place to go, that's down. You can never move up. So, in this demonstration, we're going to test one of the W-shaped bridges or the simulated arch. So, the bridge is lined up in the testing jig. Super Mario brings it up to make contact with the testing head. Now, as we come over to the graph here, 
you're going to begin to see what we were talking about earlier. The graph begins to rise. The bridge is carrying load. It's currently performance rating of 900, over 1,000 times its own weight. It's currently carrying about 500 pounds. So let's take a look now and we'll watch the bridge go to failure. Of course, a lot of screaming and yelling would help this bridge along the way. You can, you're going to be right up beside your bridge watching Super Mario break this thing. It's currently three, nearly 3,000 times its own weight in that bridge. If we take a look at the graph here, the data as we said, that bridge carried 1,310 pounds or 2,968 times its own weight. That's pretty phenomenal. I also want to point out that here at the Fennel campus we have an excellent wood shop facility. The facility will be open shortly after the bridge kits are sold and will remain open for your use until the bridge is actually due closer to the competition date. I have to point out that safety becomes a number one concern. If you have not used one of the power tools, you must receive instruction on the safe use of that machine before you absolutely use it. On top of that, we insist that you wear the full safety requirements, such as safety glasses. You're paying attention to your, uh, to your clothes, that you don't have loose clothing that could possibly become caught in the machine. So safety becomes a number one concern. Supervision will be required in the wood shop as long as the power is on. If you choose to come in here and just do some hand sanding or some gluing of sticks together and clamping, then by all means you can use the facility virtually any time. But if you want power on and you want power tools, you must have Mohawk supervision in order to use the facility. So let's talk briefly about what you're going to build. Basically, there are two styles of bridge that can be built. The first one we refer to as the true truss, which is probably what you most commonly see every day. The second style we refer to as the W shape, which in essence is a simulated arch. Now, the big difference between the two in the W shape bridge, if this is a mock-up of the testing jig that we're looking at here, you can see that when the bridge fits into the testing jig, it quite clearly uses that jig for vertical support here, but also for lateral support in terms of being able to resist the thrust that we see in a typical arch. Okay? When we come over here and look at the true truss shape, the true truss only uses the testing jig for vertical support. There's nothing pushing against the sides of the support in any form of a true truss bridge. So to qualify as a true truss, there can be absolutely no dependence on the testing jig for lateral support of any forces that the bridge has to carry. When it comes to building structures today, what is one of the most predominant shapes that we see, whether it's a bridge or a hydro tower or a building of any kind? The answer is, let's take a look and see if I start with this true truss. Basically, in my simple model here, if I start with a, a square shape, it can carry load, but the problem with it is that it can go unstable on us. So how do I fix that instability? Because remember, going unstable is counted as failure. How do I stop this instability from happening? Answer, simplest solution is to create another piece and put another piece diagonally from corner to corner. And when I do that, all of a sudden we see now that not only can we carry load, but we are, have also stabilized the structure. It doesn't want to fall over under load anymore. So how have I changed the shape and going from here to here? I think you see that I've created two triangles out of the square. And is there something magic about the triangle shape? I think there is, because not only can it carry load, but it's also a very stable shape. And if I put several triangles together, what do I end up with? A bridge, a hydro tower, the Burlington Skyway. Go and take a look. It's the triangle shape that you will see will be your friend in this competition. Let's talk briefly now about how to build the bridge. One of your keys to success will be plenty of glue. These sticks are very, very dry. They have very low moisture content. And obviously, when you go to build a bridge of this magnitude, you're going to have to start gluing sticks together. So the recipe for success, 
lots of glue on the stick, smear them in, and let them skim up, let the glue skim up for a, a moment or two, and then put the sticks together. But that's not where it stops. The other key to success now is to clamp those sticks together, as we can see here or in these various samples. Again, once you decide how big the cross section is going to be, you're going to make that out of popsicle sticks. It's imperative that you put these things into clamps and maintain the pressure on the sticks for at least an hour. By that time, the glue will have dried and the sticks will become as one. In the testing, it should always be the wood that fails, never a glue joint. The key to success, lots of glue, lots of clamps. Obviously, when it comes to building one of these bridges, be it a W shape or a true truss, there are dozens of details to consider, and we couldn't possibly go over all of them here, so ask for advice. However, let me point one out to you right now. The concept of whatever it is that you're going to build, obviously one popsicle stick is not going to do the trick for you because you've got members that are much longer than 110 mils in your bridge. So, what does that mean? That means that we have to start gluing sticks end to end as well. First step, let's square off the round ends. So now that we can have a cleaner and tighter butt joint, as we'll call it. The key to success now, when we get those two sticks together, then we're going to bring another one in and we're going to stagger that joint so that they're glued together. The key to success here is to make sure that we don't get too many of those butt joints in one particular location. So let's do a stagger pattern so that maybe every third or fourth stick, if we count across in the cross section, you'll see another butt joint. If I can demonstrate that, if we take a look at this true truss bridge here, we put it in the test jig, we loaded it to failure, this member is in tension, what happened, that's where it let go. And if I take a look at the cross section, the way the student built that, I can see one, two, three of those butt joints right in that same area. Created a weak spot in the bridge. It had no choice but to, to break at the weak link. So let's get those butt joints staggered. Make sure you don't get too many of them in one location. So, a reminder that, once again, you can only use the materials in this contest that came out of this year's bridge kit. That is, only the glue and only the sticks that come out of this year's bridge kit. No other material can be used in the contest because if it is found that you inadvertently use yellow glue or you go out and buy a dowel, you will be immediately disqualified from the competition. And yet, when we look at some of the bridges that have been constructed, we do see round shapes in there. What are the advantages of round shapes? Well, they're generally speaking, they're lighter, they're more stable than square and rectangular shapes, so they are an ideal shape to build in this bridge. How do we make them? The answer, once again, we start by taking several sticks, gluing them together, and, very importantly, clamping them, and let, letting them clamp for an hour until we get a good solid bond in there. Then, once we've got the finished product, we can turn this into a round shape in a number of ways. This material is soft enough that I could actually carve it. Um, but even easier would be to use the drill press that's located here in the woodshop facility. Simply insert your, uh, your, your laminated cross section into the drill press. Make sure you got your safety wear on, get it spinning, Take a sheet of sandpaper and simply touch that, that stick as it's spinning and you will very easily create a round shape. If you have any questions, ask an advisor to give you a hand. So that's it. In essence, this contest is all about performance rating, building the strongest but lightest bridge that you can, that you can build, and learning about how structures go together and having fun at the same time. There are big stakes and big prizes up for grabs here. There's fame, fortune, and glory, so let me wish you the best of luck.